Good morning, Seven East! Happy Thursday, people. I wish I could say happy Thursday, but um, you probably got the news that the spring break has been somewhat canceled. Um, so maybe that's making you unhappy. In either case, you would have been home anyway. So um, I guess that's the, the bright side or the dark side. I don't know what. Um, but that means you'll still be getting these free Free Radio episodes next week as well. So there is a reason to celebrate. I wish I had the applause button because that deserves an applause right there. Uh, we're on the air. And we have a special Thursday show for you today. We have sports news making a comeback. Some big stuff in the world of sports, even though no games are being played. Uh, let's take a look at our agenda. First thing on our agenda, audience Q&A. Not a lot of questions, just a few announcements as well. Second thing on our agenda, Constitution in Action. I'm going to review that slideshow. I introduced it yesterday, and now we're going to review it today. And last but certainly not least, sports news updates. We got some shocking sports news and three clips that go with it. Really amazing stuff in the sports world, even though no games are being played. Imagine that. Um, quick announcement, though. Uh, the Gim Kit from Tuesday went really well. So well that we're doing another one today, Thursday. Same time, 12.30 to 1.10. Um, I haven't received any feedback as of now, so I'm going to keep the money the same. New questions have been added, um, and the prizes stay the same. First place, 10 pieces. Uh, 10 plays 1 piece, so it goes descending order, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. That is our gim kit on Thursday, and then on Friday we have our live edition of Freeler Pre Radio in the afternoon in our Google Meet, which I will post a link for right before that meet starts at 12.30 again. So now, audience Q&A. Only two questions for you today. They're good questions, though, both from John in period 5. Uh, question. Can Congress impeach a can Congress impeach a person in the Congress? Excuse me. Answer to that question is yes. We don't hear about this a lot. We always talk about impeachment related to the president or something, but there is something in the Constitution for this as well. If we look at Article One, Section Five, it says the following: Each House, meaning each House of Congress, shall be the judge of the elections, returns, and qualifications of its own members. And a majority of each shall constitute a quorum to do business, but a smaller number may adjourn from day to day, and may be authorized to compel the attendance of absent members in such manner and under such penalties as each house may provide. Here's the key part. Each house may determine the rules of its proceedings, punish its members for disorderly behavior, and with the concurrence or agreement of two-thirds expel a member. So uh, it takes a two-thirds vote to expel a member from Congress. Um, and it has happened before. Um, it's pretty rare, though, um, just like pretty much all types of impeachments are rare. Um, I think the most recent one was possibly early. Well, I think there was there's cases where they were about to do it and they resigned, but I remember there was one in the early 2000s where I think someone either was expelled or were forced to resign. Usually if they commit a crime and it becomes public, um, even people within their own party will try to pressure them into resigning. And if they don't and it's a serious crime... With two-thirds vote, they can be impeached and thrown out of Congress. Um, and if that doesn't work, it's always our job, the people, to throw them out. So we can actually vote them out the next election if no one does anything um, in Congress while it is in session. Second question. Sometimes people get put on a retrial. How is that legal? Isn't it against the Fifth Amendment? A little complicated answer here. If the jury fails to agree on a verdict of guilty or not guilty... That is called a mistrial. And there is basically a do-over. Because technically speaking, that trial was never finished. So if you have someone on trial for murder, and the jury can't agree guilty or not guilty, some people think guilty, some people think not guilty, and they can't agree, that trial is not finished. They have not come to a conclusion. In a mistrial, what happens is you have to get a new jury. And you got to explain the arguments to the new jury, and then you have them decide. Um, that doesn't violate the Fifth Amendment because no trial was ever finished yet. So they're not trying you twice, technically speaking. It's not two separate trials after one was concluded. A violation of the Fifth Amendment would be if you were on trial for murder and the jury agreed you were innocent. That means the trial's over. You're innocent. You're free. A violation would be if the government stepped in and said, you know what? No, we're going to put you on trial again, even after it was over. 
That is double jeopardy. That is against the Constitution. Uh, but we do have mistrials. And sometimes you might see someone who is kind of an infamous criminal may be put on trial for multiple things. That's not two trials for the same crime. So let's say there was someone like in the mafia and organized crime. Um, let's say they get put on trial for several murders. Or let's say they've been accused of several murders. Um, they might only be charged with one at a time just in case the jury doesn't agree that they're guilty. So if they're not found guilty of murdering John Smith, they might be found guilty in another trial of murdering Jane Doe. Two random people. Those were our questions and answers for the day. Now, Constitution in Action, a quick review. So I'm going to X out of my presentation, go to Constitution in Action slides, and I'm going to speed through this. If you haven't done the assignment yet, um, this will be helpful for you to listen through. So like I said yesterday, each color represents a different branch. Green is Congress, purple is the president, orange is the Supreme Court. And I organized it based on what powers each branch has. So first and foremost, we should always know this. Congress, their first job and first main power is to write the bills that become the laws of our country. Only Congress gets to write the laws. Um, another big power of Congress, they decide where our tax money goes. And if Mr. Krabs was our congressperson, we would never see any of that money. It would always be at the Krusty Krab. Um, they decide where our tax money goes. Um, if the president doesn't like a bill, we're going to talk about it with the president. Um, the president can veto it, can refuse to sign it, send it back to Congress. But Congress does have a power over the president here. They can override his veto, get past his rejection of the law, as long as two-thirds majority of both houses vote for the bill again, as opposed to just a 51% majority. Other powers Congress also has over other branches. Congress can impeach the president and Supreme Court justices. They can impeach their own members too, as we just said earlier in the question and answer. But if the president or Supreme Court justices break the law or get out of line, uh, the Congress can impeach them. So it's a way to balance out the branch from that perspective. Declaring war on another country, also a power of Congress. Supreme Court can't declare war. Even the president can't declare war, even though the president does have a role to play, as we're going to see. Another power of Congress, lesser known power. They have the power to approve or disapprove people the president wants to appoint or hire to the courts, judges, and other offices. Um, so president picks a name, Congress, specifically the Senate, gets to say yes or no. So there's a close relationship between the legislative branch and the other two branches as well. So in summary, Congress writes the laws, but they also have some powers over the other branches too. That's the checks and balances. They try to make sure there's balance. Congress has some power over the judicial branch by being able to impeach the justices in the court, and they also get to approve the people who the president picks to be on the court, as well as change the Constitution through amendments if it doesn't like the court's interpretation. That's another power they have over the court. So if the court says, actually, this is un unconstitutional, Congress can say, okay, fine, we're going to change the Constitution. So now it actually fits. Congress also has the power over the president, some power by being able to impeach the president, override a presidential veto with two-thirds majority vote on any law. That does it for Congress. Now we're going to the president. A lot of this is going to sound familiar because all these branches relate to each other. So what powers does the executive branch of the president have? The president has the power to sign bills into law after they were written by Congress. The president is the one who makes it official with a signature. And after signing, the president has the power to enforce them and make sure they are followed. A law is not a law unless there's consequences for breaking it. The executive branch, the president, is the one responsible for setting the consequences and making sure it is enforced and followed. If the president doesn't like bills Congress writes, here's a check or a balance that the president has over the Congress. The president has the power to veto bills, reject them, force them to vote again and get a two-thirds majority to make them law after the veto. Depending on how divided Congress is, it's very hard to get two-thirds majority. Um, so oftentimes, um, veto has been a very powerful thing used by a president. The president is often called commander-in-chief, one of their roles in the Constitution, because they are in charge of the military. If Congress declares war, it is the president who's going to be basically the head coach of the team in that circumstance. The president makes all the decisions about strategy and about generals to hire um, and put in charge. That is the president's job as commander-in-chief. Even the Space Force, yes, Space Force is a new branch now of the military, um, and the president is commander-in-chief of that as well. And also, lesser-known thing that we don't think of, maybe we don't think of too much, but we see it a lot on TV. 
The president is our country's representative to the rest of the world and has the power to lead our diplomacy or our relationships with other countries. Think about times you see the president meeting with world leaders. That is the diplomacy aspect of the office. And some great Photoshop right here. Low level, but very unique Photoshop. The president also gets to choose the people who go on the Supreme Court and lead national offices in the executive branch. So if the FBI director retires, the president gets to pick the name with the Senate's approval of who's going to take over. Same thing with the justices in the court and other offices in the executive branch. Executive branch the movie, I choose you. Uh, Pikachu would be my um, Department of Energy secretary. Because of all the electricity. In summary, the president's main power is to enforce laws. The president has the power over the legislative branch by being able to veto his proposed laws. The president also has power over the judicial branch by being able to pick the people who are on the judicial branch to begin with. So we're already seeing there's a balance between two branches so far, and now we're going to see how it comes together with the third branch. What powers does the judicial branch of the Supreme Court have? The Supreme Court's main power is to interpret the Constitution this is called judicial review and is part of what is called the unwritten constitution, which we'll talk about more a little bit later. Think about any time you played a board game where the rules weren't clear and you argued with a friend or a family member over what the rules actually mean. You may never totally agree on what they mean and the game might end up falling apart because of that. Monopoly boards thrown up in the air, pieces scattered, fake money burnt or shredded. All of that has happened to me in the past. Uh, but it may have happened to you as well. Our government, in our system, has an entire branch dedicated just to interpreting the law. That is the job of the Supreme Court. And because they are interpreting the law, they have the power to decide top court cases the lower courts can't decide, can't interpret definitively. Even in cases between states, the Supreme Court is the one that decides. If New York and New Jersey get into a legal battle, the Supreme Court is the one that's going to settle it between states. Supreme Court also has the power to be the judge in impeachment trials of the president and other officials. So who better than the Supreme Court to be the judge at the trial of the nation's top officials? And because the Supreme Court interprets the law, it can strike down or cancel laws that it rules as unconstitutional. So I, earlier in this episode, I talked about the idea of double jeopardy. If Congress passed a law saying that double jeopardy is now okay, someone could sue, and in the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court would say, no, this law is canceled. It makes no sense. It's against the Constitution. It's going to strike down that law as unconstitutional, and then it won't be used anymore. That is a job in the power of the court. And so, in summary, the judicial branch has the main power of interpreting laws and ruling them constitutional or unconstitutional. The Supreme Court has the power over the president, by being the judge during impeachment trials of the president and by canceling presidential actions that violate the Constitution. The Supreme Court has power over Congress by also being able to cancel laws Congress passes that are considered to violate the Constitution. In the end, everything in the government under the U.S. Constitution is designed to be perfectly balanced as all things should be, so that no one person or group has all of the power in their hands like a king or queen. Remember, when we're looking at the Constitution, it might be difficult to see what they imagined, but it's not difficult to imagine what they did not want to see at all, and that was a king. They wanted to avoid a type of government where one person has all the power. You split the power up into three parts and have balance, like one massive game of rock, paper, scissor, where there isn't only one thing you can put out that will always win. There is balance, and when there's balance, you have a better chance to have freedom, justice, and all that good stuff. And now, if you haven't done so already, it's your turn. You're going to use these slides to solve the scenarios in the Google Form Assessment. If you already did them, you're going to have a really good leg up on the competition in Ginkit today. And now I'm going to head back to our radio show because it is time for Sports News Update. Amazing, exciting stuff. Uh, three amazing stories in the sports world for you today. Without further ado, let's go. Story 1. Outdoor child bowling renews sport after bowling alley closures. So with all the social distancing going on, bowling alleys have closed, but that has not stopped the bowling enthusiasts out there. They've actually found a new way to continue practicing this great sport, and that is using their children as bowling balls. We have some footage of one of the first inaugural matches. It's really some exciting stuff. Take a look. <laughs> Brilliant.
brilliant athleticism there. Um, only need 11 more strikes to get a perfect 300. Let's see if the kid will make it. Uh, story number two. Out-of-work TV hosts turn to in-real-life Mario Kart racing during quarantine. Can't believe it. Daytime talk show hosts thinking of ways to keep themselves occupied during this quarantine. Dr. Phil, Steve Harvey, they've started their own Mario Kart League, and we have footage of one of the first races. Here it comes. I really hope they had some insurance on those vehicles because I counted at least two potentially criminal acts of automotive violations, uh, one involving a possible hit and run. Um, so I'm sure they got the finances and the lawyers to get them out of that. Uh, nonetheless, I would still love to watch this um, being home. Um, can't wait to see who gets that blue spiked shell and knocks one of the racers out of the racetrack with one of those okay story number three we're gonna end this i can't exactly say it's on a high note um maybe the lowest of the low uh but from the wrestling world wwe's vince mcmahon in the hospital can you believe it time displacement syndrome he seems to be under the impression that it's 1998 um and he was attacked in the hospital can you believe it and we have some inside sources they got us footage of this vicious attack on Vince McMahon in a hospital. Hope he gets well soon, but here's the clip. Looks just fine to me. How about you, doctor? Oh, I'll take it from here, nurse. No, 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 I'm speechless. A lot more violent than I expected. Um, I think the most appalling part of that video, though, was that Stone Cold Steve Austin was not wearing a mask or gloves. You think if you're going to attack your boss, you'd have the courtesy to at least not put them at risk of other things by at least wearing some gloves, but apparently that was not on his mind. Uh, that'll do it for today's episode of Freely Free Radio. Uh, tomorrow is Friday. Exciting for that. Not really, but cool anyway. Signing off.